If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were talking about the Lord's Supper. And in the 11th chapter, 28th verse, it says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. It says, let you examine or test yourself. In the 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, the 5th verse, it says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Another translation says in that last part, where it says in the King James, except ye be reprobates, it says, unless you fail the test. See, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, how can I know that God loves me. How can I know that I love God? Well, it says here to examine, test yourself, put yourself under examination, try yourself and find out if you love God, find out about those things. We need to understand that, you know, in, in 1 Corinthians, the eighth chapter and the third verse, it says, but if any man love God, the same is known of him. It says, if we love God, God loves us. God knows who we are. Yes. See, we got to understand that. If we really love God, how do we know? How do we know that God loves us? How do we know God? Well, psychologists tell us that uh, a lot of the way we perceive God is based on our earthly father. Yes. If we had an earthly father that was very much a disciplinarian, that was very much, you know, a consequent kind of guy. We kind of tend to see God that way. And that's the way the Old Testament people saw God. They walked around in Israel. They walked around in the wilderness. They walked around wondering all the time, does God care about us? Does God know our pain? You know, does God grieve when our nation suffers? But we see all this stuff in John, the first chapter, the 14th verse. It, it says, the word... It says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. See, we need to understand, God, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, I'm not teaching some Jesus only thing here. I'm telling you that God, came, God sent his son so that we could see how God was really like. God sent his son so that we could understand what he was really like. You know, we walk through this life and we see our father as a great big disciplinarian and we start thinking that, you know, God's going to come down on us every time we make a mistake. God's going to punish us every time we make a mistake. Yes. But, you know, we need to understand that's the reason he sent Jesus so that we can look at him in a different light. Uh, several years ago, I went with my dad in Kentucky. One of his brothers was really sick. My dad's the youngest of 15 kids. And he was concerned and we drove down there. And we visited his brother, and as he was going through, you know, we were driving through those hills, and I was hearing all these stories. All of a sudden, my dad wasn't that strict disciplinarian that I grew up with, that I was afraid of, that if I broke a rule, I was afraid of punishment coming down on me. He became, he became a friend to me. He became like another person. And we started talking, and we started reminiscing, and we started sharing times. And all of a sudden, you know, the... The guy that led me, all of a sudden, I was a friend with. And I started to see a change in him. And when we came home, he hugged my neck and told me he loved me. Yes. And I'd only heard him tell me he loved me. I knew he loved me all my life. I knew that he cared about me all my life. He put a roof over my head, put food on the table. He disciplined me. He made sure that I had the things that I needed. But on that trip, something changed. I saw my dad in a different light. I saw him in, in the, you know, as a person that you know, I had to help. Before, he was the person I leaned on. on. But after that trip, I started to be the person he leaned on. And the roles kind of changed. And it was the same way when Jesus Christ came oh, down here. Yes. We started seeing that God wasn't that disciplinarian, but he was a father that oh, loved us. You know, we, were, we knew that we were loved because the Bible tells us that God is love. We knew that we were loved because he told us that. But we need to understand that he loves us. And he doesn't love us just as a creator, but he loves us as a father loves a child. As we are here on this earth, you know, he said, if your child asked for a fish, would you give him a serpent? If he asked for bread, would you give him a rock? Hallelujah. If our earthly fathers, being carnal, know how to treat us, 
How much better does our Heavenly Father know how to treat us? So we need to understand that He loves us as a Father, just not as a Creator. Oh, yeah. So God loves us, but we've got to know Him and get to know Him and find out all about Him. And through Jesus Christ coming down here on this earth to die for our sins, He sent the best that He had. He loved us enough that He sent the best that He had yeah. so that we could have eternal life. Jesus Christ shed His blood for the remission of our sins so we could have overcoming life. You know, if we really love God, we'll obey. And this is where it gets into. You know, it says, well, if you love, if you love me, keep my commandments. Come on. And people are like, well, it's hard to do that. Well, I'm here to tell you, as I got older, when I lived at home with my dad, I did what he said because I was afraid to punish my brother Johnny. I did, did what he said because I thought there was going to be a consequence. So I had a reverential fear that as I got older, I didn't live in that house. There weren't going to be the same kind of consequence. So when he asked me to do something, I did it because I loved him. I obeyed him because I respected him. I obeyed him because I wanted to please him. See, that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to love him enough that we will obey him. And the only way we can obey him is by knowing what's in the word of God. The only way we can obey him and follow after him is understand that he loves us enough, and if we love him enough, we're going to want to please him. We're not going to worry about all the other stuff. We're not going to worry about the consequences. We're not going to worry about what's going to happen when we fail. Think about your children. If they mess up and they come to you with tears in their eyes, say, Daddy, Mom, I'm sorry. Forgive me. What are you going to do? You're going to forgive them. And God is no different. See, we've got to want to serve him. We've got to want to please him. We need to understand that. That gives us the opportunity to show him that we love him over and over again when we obey the things. You know, we need to understand there's a lot of people out there that are sowing their wild oats. They're out there, you know, trying to put their will and trying to slap God's name on it. But they're out there sowing wild oats and hoping that they have a crop family. I'm here to tell you that if you jump off a 10-story building... You're going to come to a abrupt halt at the ground. You're going to splat at the ground. You know, if you live in a moral life, you're going to reap what you sow. Yeah. If you do all these things, if you go out there and try to tickle the world, try to play with alcohol, try to play with drugs, you're going to reap what you sow. We need to understand the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Yeah. Our bodies are great big reservoirs. The, as long as we put good stuff in this, imagine yourself as a big five-gallon milk bucket. And if all you put in there is good stuff, when you tip that milk bucket up, what's going to come out is good stuff. Amen. You know, but if you start mixing things in, if you start mixing in muddy water, if you start mixing in sin, you start mixing in alcohol, when you tip that up, bad things happen. So the more stuff that we put in our life, the more good stuff that we put in. Yeah. See, we've got to want to serve God more than we want any of that other stuff. We can't, give the, we can't give the devil an opportunity. We can't give him an inch. Because when that lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. We've got to put good stuff in this life. We've got to fill this reservoir up with good stuff. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if the more good stuff we put in here, the more good stuff's going to come out of this mouth. The more good stuff's going to come out of these hands. The more good stuff's going to come out of this feet. We need to understand, by obeying God's word, we express the love that we have for God. By obeying what the word of God says, we express that love. The third thing that the Bible tells us, in 1 John, the fourth chapter, if we really love God, we'll really love each other. John, the fourth chapter, the 11th verse, it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us, or matured in us. See, we need to understand, go down to the 20th verse, it says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother... He is a liar, for he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Try yourself and find out where your heart is. Try yourself and find out where your heart is. See, we need to understand, if we're going to call ourselves children of God, if we're going to say that we love God, but we can't love the people that we're in the church house with, if we can't love the people that we're in bonds with, we need to understand, we need to go back and examine ourselves again. We need to go back and check it out in 2 Corinthians and examine ourselves and see if we're passing the test. 
We need to understand 1 John, the second chapter, the 11th verse. It says, But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whether he goeth, because that darkness has blinded his eyes. See, we don't even know where we're going. If we say we hate our brother, we're walking in darkness. We've been blinded by the enemy of this world. See, we need to understand. Do you get the point? John emphasized it all through this first letter of John. He said, hey, understand what I'm saying. You've got to love one another. If you can't love your brother, don't dare say that you love God. If you can't love those things, don't dare say that you love God. There, you know, those that you know history know about the Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette. He was a French soldier. He was actually a French nobleman that came and fought with George Washington in the Revolutionary War. Matter of fact, he was instrumental in us winning the Battle of Yorktown, the final uh, victory for the Revolutionary Forces. And he went back to his vast estate in France. And in 1783, there was a blight in all of Europe. There was a blight in all of Europe that took out all kinds of farms. But Lafayette's farms were untouched. His barns were full of grain. His barns were overflowing. And one of his friends came to him. He said, Lafayette, now's the time to sell because the grain prices are higher than they've ever been in our lifetime. But Lafayette looked around at the countryside and the villages and saw all the people that were hungry and the people that were without, the people that were starving. He goes, now is not the time to sell. Now is the time to give. See, that's the kind of love that we need to have for our fellow man. That's the kind of love that we need to have for our brothers. You might look out there and see a drug addict. You may look out there and see an alcoholic. You may out there look out there and see something else. But God looks down and sees a soul that needs a salvation. We need to understand that Jesus Christ came to all the world. He came to all of us to reach down, to reach out his hand. We need to understand that. In John, the 17th chapter, the 20th verse, it says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. And again, like I said before, I'm not talking Jesus only. I'm talking about we ought to have the same spirit that Jesus Christ had. We ought to have the same thinking that Jesus Christ had. See, because Jesus came down to fulfill what God wanted him to do. Uh, uh, Juan Carlos Ortiz calls it mashed potato love. And he illustrates it this way. He says, imagine digging up a bunch of potatoes. You look around and you see all these potatoes. And they're all individual potatoes. And you pick them up and you put them in a big potato sack and you take them to be cleaned off. And somebody there at the plant cleans them up and puts them in a five-gallon bag, five-pound bags. But they're still individual potatoes. You take them home. You scrub them off. You peel them. You put them in your sink. And you put them in a pot to boil. They're getting closer together, but they're still potatoes. Yes. See, we can't sit in the house of God, no matter how clean we are, no matter how close we're sitting together, but we've got to be just like those boiled potatoes. When they pull them out, they put them in a pot, and they begin to mash them up. And they begin to put them together. Pretty soon, you don't see, oh, this big potato there, and that little potato there. You see, we're all mashed together. We've all become one with the Spirit of God. We've all become one with the purpose that God has called us to do. We need to understand, it's when we're blended together, when we love the Lord the most, we've got to love one another enough to become one in Christ Jesus yes. so that we can fulfill what the world needs today. That's what he said there. He goes, in that 22nd verse, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them, and thou and me, that they may be perfect in one. And that 21st verse it said, And they, they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Right. See, as we come together, that mashed potato love, as we come together if, with one mind and with one accord, we find out that we are doing the purpose that God has yeah. wanted us to do. We've got to come together as one. Finally, if we really... If we really, really, really love God, really. we will abide in him and he will abide in us. In 1 John, the 14th, the 4th chapter, and the 14th verse, 
In the 15th verse, it's, excuse me, 15th verse, it said, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in him, love dwelleth in God, and God in him. See, if we really love God, we will abide in him. Jesus, in the 15th chapter of John, said, I am the vine. I am the true vine. And he goes, and if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But if we don't bear fruit, we're going to be cut off and wither and be cast into the fire. See, we've got to dwell in the Lord. We've got to dwell in all that. It says we need to understand we've got to remain is what the sixth verse of that 15th chapter says of John. Remain in him. Stay in him. What does it mean to abide in Christ? Well, if I'm abiding in Christ and he's the vine and I'm the branch, I'm receiving everything that I need from that vine. I'm receiving all the nourishment that I need. I'm receiving all the food that I need. I'm receiving all the encouragement I need. He is my provision. He is my provider. I'm receiving everything that I need to be able to be fruitful. I'm receiving everything that I need to be able to be productive. I've got to, I've got to abide in the vine. Finally, there's a, a old legend that goes, there's a wealthy merchant in the first century that wanted to meet Paul before he was put to death in Rome. He talked to Timothy, and you know, as we read the story of Paul, you know, in his service to God, he only spent seven free years. The rest of his life he spent in jail. He died, you know, he was put to death there in Rome. But this merchant, the story goes, wanted to meet Paul. So he talked to Timothy. And Paul was, you know, had favor and he was allowed to have all kinds of visitors. And this wealthy merchant went to see Paul and it wasn't what he expected because when he walked into the cell, cell, he saw this frail old man that was hunched over, that was old, that was, you know, tired. But his serenity challenged the merchant. And they talked for hours and hours. And stepping outside the cell, the merchant said, Timothy, how does he have so much peace? How does he have so much serenity? What's the secret to all that? And Timothy said, you can't guess. Paul is in love. And the merchant said, in love? What do you mean? He goes, well, yes, he's in love. He said, he's completely in love with Jesus Christ. And the merchant said, is that all? And Timothy smiled at him and said, sir, that is everything. See, we have to be in love with you. If we want the peace that passes all understanding, if we want that joy unspeakable and full of glory, we've got to have Jesus more than we have anything else. We've got to want Jesus more than we want anything else in our life. Do you really love God? Then these four things should be part of your life. You'll know God. You'll obey God. You'll love each other. And you'll abide in Him. If you can't answer yes to those questions, if you can't answer yes to those conditions, then I invite you today to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I invite you today to examine yourself, to test yourself, and find out where your heart really is today. You know, we, we yes. love God, and we show it by our obedience to God because we want to obey God. Will you pray with me today? Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you and we praise you once again for the privilege of being able to come before you today for the privilege, Lord, that we have in this country, that we can lift your name on high, that we can come to you on these airways, on the radio, on Facebook, whatever means necessary to get your word across, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you make us one even as you and Jesus are one, that you make us one mind, one accord, one spirit, Lord, so that we can accomplish your will in this life. And Lord, if there be anything in our life that would prevent us from serving you with our whole heart, we ask that you remove it. Lord, we ask that you fill us up. Lord, you fill us up with good stuff, that you fill this reservoir up with good stuff so that we can know that we are children of the King, so that we can know that only good stuff's going to come out. Lord, we need to want you more than we want the drugs. We need to want you more than we want the alcohol. We need to want you more than whatever else stands between us and you. We've got to want you more than anything else. We've got to be completely in love with you. Lord, we ask that you forgive us, Lord. As a nation, forgive us as a people, forgive us as a church. And Lord, place us in the proper place for the work that you've got for us in these last days. 
Lord, we ask that you watch over the leaders of our country, that you give them the wisdom, the courage to do what they need to do. Watch over the frontline people, Lord, the doctors, the nurses, all the people that work in the hospital, the housekeepers, the people working dietary, the transporters, the x-ray people, all those people, Lord. We ask that you watch over them and keep them safe. Lord, all the ones that work in the nursing home. Lord, watch over our firemen, our police officers, our soldiers. Remember those, Lord, and keep a shield and a covering over them. Lord, watch over our nation. Lord, return us. Lord, return us to the way that you would have us to go. Lord, let the church stand up and be counted as the church of Jesus Christ. Let the church stand up and be counted as worthy to be called sons and daughters of God. And Lord, we'll not fail to give you the praise and the glory for all you do in Christ's precious holy name. And Lord, for those requests that we had before, we ask that you move upon all those. Brother Sizemore, Brother James, Lord, Sister Sheila, Sister Debbie Combs, Kika, we ask that you remember all those people, Lord. We ask that you touch those people that have lost loved ones. We ask, Lord, that you give those people travel mercies. Watch over Sissy, Lord, as she drives back home. Watch over her and keep her safe. And Lord, we ask all this in Christ's precious holy name. Amen. Thanks once again for joining us today. We hope that we've said something, done something. Again, hit share. Uh, give us a comment. Uh, give us some kind of emoji. Let us know. Uh, continue to remember uh, Wednesday night at 730. Remember, ladies, remember the pandemic prayers. Uh, if you've got children, uh, Miss Ainsley's got some things on our web page and our Facebook page. I think there's another one being uploaded today. I remember that. Uh, also, um, stay tuned for updates on May 31st. Uh, we just appreciate everybody out there taking the time to be with us. Uh, we pray that uh, you have a blessed day. I want to do one last thing before we say goodbye. Ha happy anniversary, baby. I love you. It's uh, my and Christina's anniversary in the... Have a blessed day, and I'll see you very, very soon. You, and everybody else, I'll see you very, very soon, too. God bless. Have a great day. We'll see you.